Hello, and welcome to this service of worship at the First Presbyterian Church in Titusville, Pennsylvania. We welcome you on this first Sunday in Advent as we prepare our hearts for the journey to Bethlehem and to the journey of Christ Jesus. We have this morning a speaker, a special speaker, Dr. Jim Bibza from Grove City College, and I'm sure you'll enjoy him as he speaks this morning. Thank you. Join me in the prayer of hope. O oh, come to us, our Lord Emmanuel. We need you. Come to us in some unexpected insight, some invasion of unlooked for power, and work your transforming miracle in our hearts. In this Advent season, we continue to confess our sins, trusting in your love, like the prodigal, we have been wandering and willful. All of us in some measure have wasted the inheritance that is ours as your sons and daughters. We have wandered from faith and hope. Our sin is in forgetting that the worst the world could do does not separate us from your love. Help us experience the hope in the manger once again this Advent. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Would the congregation please be seated? We welcome you this first Sunday of Advent. I don't know, it just seems like we had Thanksgiving. But we are thankful that you're here. We are thankful that you are here with your families. And it is truly a blessing to have you. And if you would grab the Covenant of Fellowship pew pad, which is the red pads, if you would write your name and address down that we might make a um, make comment of you being with us today. So we're just happy that you're here. And look, we'll look through the announcements, one special announcement. We welcome Dr. Jim Bibza to the pulpit this morning from Grove City College. Um, December, December 10th is our hanging of the greens. We are not decorated yet, but we will be if you come and help us decorate. So that is Wednesday, December 10th, and it'll be starting at four o'clock, and then at six o'clock we will have dinner together, and after dinner we'll, the youth will have the fruit baskets that the adults make up, and we will deliver those. So hanging the greens is always fun. We hope you'll be a part of that, and as we look at the other announcements and page through them, Triple F is planning a Thanksmas party. It was great last year. I'm sure it's going to be just as fun. Um, it will be Sunday, December 8th at 530. And we'd love to have you. You can see the details of bringing a gift and also sign up to bring um, a salad or a vegetable or a dessert. Um, the turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes will be provided. So if you would sign up in the office, we would love to have you. The Christmas tree will, treat will be distributed uh, Sunday, December 22nd. Um, the youth choir, we're trying to put together a youth choir that will sing Sunday, December 22nd. So all middle schoolers and senior highs. This is part of Jacob Rash's uh, senior project. So he will be directing it. And we will begin practice December 4th, and uh, you see the details there. And this is the announcements for this morning. Thank you.
against that beautiful backdrop. Hear the word of God in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 26, beginning with verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked. The angel said, since I am a virgin, or Mary said, ask the angel, since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will be overshadowed you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And even Elizabeth's relative is going to have a child in her old age, and she will was said to be unable to conceive in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your son, may your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. This ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray, beginning with silent meditation. Dear Lord, we praise you this morning, this very moment as we gather to worship, as we gather to worship you, O oh Lord, in this season of Advent. This very hour we know as Christians, as believers, that you, O oh God, are present with us. In that very presence, there is a sense of joy and comfort a sense of your love and joy within us all, that Christ is ever present in our lives. As the angel told Mary not to fear, we should not fear. Lord, this day you lead and we will truly follow. Help us to face the challenges of life this week and to overcome the obstacles or fears that we might have. Forgive us, Lord, when we stray from your presence. Lord, you tell us in your word to consider it pure joy, my brother, whenever you face trials of many kind. Oh, Lord, that is so much harder for us to face this day. However, you do not call us to do this alone, and that is why it can be such a joyful time in the challenges we face because you are there. Forgive us of our wrongs. Help us to do what is right. We pray for our church and our church leaders in this season of love. We pray for our community, our nation, as we pray, prepare for this season of love. We pray for each other, for our church family, Prepare our hearts, O oh Lord. Help us to be ever mindful of each other and to love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, we pray for help to see clearly what is within our hearts. You know and accept us as we are. 
Lord, you are our comfort and our strength. Lift up all the people, especially those that are in need of your healing touch. We pray for Jane Yingling. We pray for Vi Bowen, Annabelle Zaner, Dick Smith. We pray for the, the needs of others. And we pray that we would heed the message of the angel that spoke to Mary, fear not, trust in the Lord. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. The one who prayed and taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would the children please come forward for the children's moments? Hey, child. Oh, there's more coming. All right. Bring some of the sheep. Now, I don't think the three of you would recognize this. But we made these wonderful paper crafts in our children's group. And uh, they were these little pumpkins. And what we talked about was what we were thankful for. And some of the things that we are thankful for are our homes and our family, of course, mom and dad and our friends. And this particular person put down uh, Jay and Trevor, which are my grandchildren. So that's a little um, good to know. And then they prayed for food and water and just all the things that we pray for and that we're thankful for. So we don't, now that Thanksgiving's over, we don't say all of a sudden, um, we're not thankful. We're thankful all year round. And as we approach a different season, you would understand this, that it's the season of Advent. And we talked about that upstairs. That's why the candle was lit. And we will have four Sundays where we prepare ourselves for Christmas. And not just all the things that you expect when we prepare for Christmas. Not just the decorating and the buying of presents. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about preparing our hearts that we can realize just how much Jesus loves us, just how much God loves us, that he brought his son into the world as a baby in the manger. And we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking about that more as, as we continue in this Advent season. So we'll prepare our hearts this day and weeks to come. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the Advent season and we thank you for each other. Blessing upon our families and our church family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I was here, I think, in the summertime once before. And the bad news is Barry's asked me to be here four times next year. So I'm sorry. I got him drinking, and that's what happened. Uh, I have to uh, say, this is serious now, uh, I was really impressed with your choir. Uh, you guys, you sounded very, very wonderful and uh, certainly added to the worship this morning. I was a little concerned. Uh, we've just, my wife and I just came back from a couple days in Williamsburg. And of course they have the stockades and so forth all around. And as Tom was introducing me, he mentioned you know, Jim Bibso, Grove City College, and the next word out of his mouth was hanging. And I was a little concerned there, but then he mentioned the green stuff and I relaxed a little bit more. I thought there was enough pressure preaching God's word, let alone not knowing. Yeah, yeah, Now I don't know what the greens have done, but I'm sure they deserve, they deserve it. Seems like every church has a greens that deserves hanging. Well, our second text this morning, we're going to be looking at both of these passages this morning, and Tom read the first one to you in Luke 1, and we continue then in Luke 2, picking up with verse 8. Now, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they were made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been been told of them. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we look together at your word, I pray this morning that we might be able to see this through Mary's eyes and we might understand the joy of the birth of Jesus, but also the apprehension and the turmoil that this would have caused Mary. We pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Most of us think of a child, birth of a child as almost a uniformly positive, joyful event. And we, we look at passages as the, uh, the message of the angels to the shepherds, a great joy and so forth, and we sing songs like Joy to the World at this time of the year. And so we think that things would be kind of the way we see them. Uh, if, somebody, uh, is, uh, if somebody is pregnant, uh, usually this is something that uh, they let other people know, other people rejoice with it. At my church, I'm sure, in, uh, with some of you, uh, when we have somebody that's, uh, that's pregnant, oftentimes uh, someone in the congregation will, during our time of joys and concerns, will announce the joy that so-and-so is pregnant and whenever the birth comes, it's a matter of great joy. Uh, there are uh, showers given. Uh, there are birth announcements sometimes. Uh, it, we, we, it's almost, almost universally a joyful time. I'm not sure that it was so unambiguously joyful for Mary, however. Now, we don't know much about Mary. 
they're all kind of legends that are much later than the scriptures uh, about Mary. Most of those are, in fact, uh, ones that have little or no historical value. But there are a few things we can surmise. We know, for example, that Jewish girls in the first century normally got married between the ages of 12 and 16. And so if we split the difference, we might think we know that Mary was probably, say, 14. Now, that's like an eighth or ninth grader, okay? We know she was Jewish because we know that her descent, uh, she's in the line of David. We're almost certain that her family was poor. We know this because 40 days later, whenever Joseph and Mary, after the birth of Jesus, whenever they give the, uh, the offering for purification, they're not able to give the lamb and the pigeon that are normally expected. And if, in fact, Mary's family had been at all well-to-do, both the dowry as well as the marriage, the wedding gifts would have certainly been able, allowed them to give the standard offering. They had to give the offering to the poor. So a young, early teenage Jewish girl coming from a poor family is what we can be pretty certain of. So we turn to the birth announcement in Luke 1, the passage that Tom read. And we see that this actually would have caused Mary a good deal of anguish. After all, the fact that she was going to be born, have a child out of wedlock, was going to be a, a matter of great shame in the first century. Up until fairly recently, in America, it was still a matter of great shame. Today, not so much. But I can remember 50 years ago, being a boy of 13 and remembering uh, people in hushed voices talking about somebody who was uh, pregnant and, and wasn't married. Well, here's Mary. She is now told she's engaged. Now, we, we think, treat engagement as something that's a private matter between the, the boy and the girl, the man and the woman, not in the first century. There's a public ceremony. There's the, there's, there's a, they would have a canopy that would be set up, and there would be give, a dowry, early dowry given. There would be commitments. You had to get a bill of divorcement in order to stop the engagement. To have intercourse when you were engaged was tantamount to adultery in the first century. It brought great shame upon her, her family. And you say to me, well, wait a second. It was the Holy Spirit that did it. Okay, your teenage daughter comes home from school. She's in eighth or ninth grade. She starts to throw up. What's the matter? I'm pregnant. Who did it? The Holy Spirit did it. Oh, yeah, you'll buy that one, won't you? Mary knows no one is going to buy, no one is going to believe that the Holy Spirit did it. Mary understands that she will be branded a harlot or worse. Why, after all, does Mary travel to Bethlehem? Only the males needed to, be in the, to go for the census. Would you put men, would you put your very, very pregnant wife on a donkey and take her on a journey that was difficult and dangerous? When if she gave birth on the way, almost certainly the baby would die? Why on earth would you make Mary go through such an ordeal? Why not let her stay with her family and friends and let her give birth there? Maybe it's because her family had turned its back on her. Maybe because she couldn't take the whispers. She couldn't take the, look at Mary. Mary the harlot. Mary the un. The, the one who wasn't married. And she still holds on to that Holy Spirit story. She's not dealing with reality, is she? 
Now, nobody in their right mind would have gone on that kind of trip unless you kind of had to, unless you just couldn't take the mockery and the abuse anymore. Mary, as a good Jewish girl, like many girls today, would have dreamt of her wedding. Especially for a poor girl, this would have been her best chance to move out of the social environment that she was in. I have a granddaughter who's nine, who since the time she was about five, has had a wedding book. She can tell me what her wedding dress is going to look like. The boy next door doesn't know it, but he's the groom. <laughs> Guys find this somewhat bizarre, and maybe some of you females do as well, but some of you know exactly what we're talking about here. Now you say, well, why would Mary have been upset about this? Well, the engagement was off, folks. The wedding was off. She was damaged goods. She was no longer a virgin. And you say, well, but Joseph would have accepted Mary's word, would he not? Read Matthew 1. Joseph hears the story, and he says, yeah. And Joseph has decided that he's going to divorce her quietly. Again, you actually have to have a divorce in order to break an engagement. Joseph wasn't buying the Holy Spirit story. He didn't want to make her family have any more public shame, and so he was going to divorce her quietly. Her dreams of a wonderful wedding were shattered. We also know that Mary was highly unlikely to be sinless, as some traditions would suggest. First of all, there's no mention of her sinlessness in the text. In fact, the only two requirements for Mary to be the one who would give birth to the Savior was that she was to be a virgin and she was to be in the line of David. And even the line of David isn't mentioned in the account of the angel, only her virginity. Now, the text says she was highly favored. Oh, favored one, the ESV. Some translations have Hail Mary full of grace. Grace is, by definition, unmerited favor. It's something you don't deserve. There's nothing about Mary that caused the Lord to say, this is the one who's going to bear the Messiah. It was God's choice. It was, it was an honor. She was favored because she was be honored to give birth to the Savior, to the Messiah. Even the phrase highly favored or favored ones tells you that the favor comes from God, not within. It's a matter of grace that she was given this honor. And in fact, it detracts from Mary's commitment and Mary's obedience and the sacrifice that Mary made to suggest that she was sinless. After all, if she was sinless, of course she was going to go along with it. To do otherwise would be sinful, and we know she's sinless, and so no big deal. Of course, if she was sinless, she would have never thought that Jesus was crazy, as the Gospels in the middle of one of the, uh, the Gospels talk about Mary and the boys coming to try to drag Jesus away because they think he's a little bit bonkers. Now, you see, it's an ordinary 14-year-old poor peasant girl who has been chosen for the honor of bearing the Messiah. And it is out of the blue that she has told this. And even though, even though she doesn't understand much, even though on the surface of it, it looks like it would destroy all of her plans, all of her hopes and dreams, she clearly is willing to do it. I mean, after all, what kind of explanation is there given to her when she asks the question, how will this be since I'm a virgin? How could I possibly have a child? What does, what does the Holy Spirit say? Or what does the angel say? The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. My goodness, is that a vague comment? If I'm Mary, I'm thinking, is this going to hurt? 
the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow me. In the words of Tommy Boy, is this going to leave a mark? But no, she accepts. She says to the angel, may be to me as you have said. What is clear is that Luke wants to contrast two people in the, in the account. You have to read a little further, and I thought two passages were more than enough. But you have to read about John the Baptist's dad, Zacharias, who was a priest, but who was spiritually blind. And you remember, he was cursed with, he could not speak because of his lack of faith in the temple. When he was doing the one day of the year, his high point of his priestly career, the one day he would be allowed to go into the temple and offer incense. And yet he doesn't have eyes of faith. Luke wants to contrast the religious establishment that should believe and doesn't. And this poor peasant girl who has faith and believes and obeys. When we move forward to the story then of the shepherd, the shepherds with all the wonder that they have, again, it was a supernatural conception, but it was an ordinary human birth. And so I want you to, I want to ask you a question. Let's suppose, some of you can remember this, you've just given birth. You're, you're home from the hospital now. And your husband says, there's a knock on the door, and your husband says, honey, there's some shepherds here who want to see Jesus, and they say they have some gifts. Shepherds are despised in the first century. They're lowly. They're seen as being robbers and cheats. Kind of like, honey, there's some Jehovah's Witnesses at the door, and they have some literature they want to give you. You might think of sending these folks away. Not Mary. Come on in. She, they come in. They present their gifts. And they tell Mary this fantastic story about how angels had come and the singing and a savior and that they told him where he was going to be born. And that just as Mary had been told by the angel nine months before, these shepherds say that this baby, this ordinary baby, was going to be the savior of the world. He would be the promised Messiah, the Messiah that the Jews had been looking forward to for at least 800 years. We get impatient when we have to wait 20 minutes for something, or two or three years let alone 800 years. Yes, this was an announcement of great joy for the world, for us. For Mary, it was a mixed blessing. And what does she do? Well, she obviously doesn't understand it. The, whole, the text says that nobody really understood it all. They wondered about this. How could this be? But the text says that Mary treasured these things in her heart and pondered them. Sometimes when we get more revelation than we can handle, when we read things in the Bible that kind of blow our minds, that we can't quite wrap our minds around altogether, it's good to think about them and ponder them and pray over them. What does this all have to do with us? Well, we certainly see that God oftentimes works in what appears to us to be strange ways, unexpected ways. In the prayer of hope that you had this morning, come in some unexpected insight, some invasion of unlooked for power and work your transforming miracle in our hearts. Mary certainly had an invasion that was unlooked for. She certainly had something that was unexpected. But the fact is that God knew exactly what he was doing. And even though it came out of the blue to Mary, God understood what he was doing. And although it's not always true, it's not as if the, uh, God never works through the well-to-do, nevertheless, God oftentimes chooses the lowly, 
the despised, the people who are rejected by society, the people who don't, don't have it all together as far as they're, they're not on a reality show. They, the entertainment tonight never mentions our names. And yet, here it is, a young woman. Young women in general and young women in particular were not well respected in the first century. Shepherds were despised. And yet, who is the first evangelist? Who is the one that shares the good news? Who is the one who has the opportunity to see the Son of God for the first time? It's the lowly shepherds. And who is given the honor, the privilege of giving birth to this Messiah? The poor peasant girl. Now the fact of the matter is God rarely explains things to us. He expects us to trust him with what's left unsaid. That's what Mary did. That's what the shepherds did. None of them had everything all figured out, did they? If I had an opportunity, I'm willing to bet that I could go around this room and I could have person after person testify to how God had worked in their lives in ways very unexpected, ways that were different than what they had planned. And yet God knew exactly what he was doing. I was a math education major in college. Here I am. Not exactly what I'd planned. In fact, when I went to seminary because I wanted to teach, I didn't, I, I didn't enroll in the MDiv program because I was sure that I wasn't going to be a pastor. God has a sense of humor. Put me in the pulpit for the last 33 years. When, when God acts in ways different than what we expect, we can either fight against it, we can, like Paul, kick against the goads, and say, well, it can't be. This is not the kind of Messiah I'm looking for, therefore we can't be. God doesn't work this way. God doesn't do this with me. I got my life planned out. This is not part of the plan. Maybe cancer. It might be an unexpected birth. It may be who knows what. But how do we respond? Well, I can tell you how Mary responded. Mary stands before us as a model of faith and obedience. A young teenager chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. It might wreck her life. All of her plans would be turned upside down. And yet she says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you've said. I really don't think that you and I can improve on that model of faith and obedience of Mary. Would you pray with me? Lord God, as we have examined your word, and as we try to see this event through Mary's eyes, we sanitize it, we, we, we make it something that it's not. Yet in the midst of all the confusion and all the things, all the unanswered questions, Mary stands as a model for all of us. May each one of us, when life takes a turn that we don't expect. When you put challenges in front of us, may we respond with the same faith and obedience that Mary did. For may we trust that you always know what you're doing, even if we don't understand it. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.
Let us pray together the prayer of commitment and thanksgiving. To your kingdom, which cannot fail, and to your purposes, which are forever true. And in the spirit of your Son, our Lord, we offer these gifts and dedicate our lives, O God, to the service of others and to the glory of your name. Amen. And now may the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon and abide with each one of you, now and forevermore. Amen. We hope that this service was meaningful to you and we welcome you back next week and hope that you will continue the journey this Advent season with us here at the First Presbyterian Church in Titusville. God bless you and good day. originating from the birthplace of the oil industry, we are the stream. Yeah.